thankful we are here this morning. We call upon you this morning and as you give you praise. Praise the Lord in His sanctuary this morning. Praise Him in, in His sanctuary above. Praise Him and the assembly of the saints this morning. May your Amen. peace be within these walls and your spirit within the heart of all the saints. Give ear to our prayer, Lord, this morning as we gather here. And we will give you thanks forever and ever. May your Holy Spirit take over. Glad we are as we stand here in your presence in this house. May the grace, peace of our Lord Jesus Christ be each and every one of us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. <coughs> Open your Bibles to the ninth Psalm, Psalm number nine. We're going to begin with verse nine, Psalm nine, verse nine. The Lord also will be a stronghold for the oppressed, a stronghold in times of trouble. The Lord will be a stronghold win for the oppressed and in times of trouble. And those who know your name will put their trust in you. Yes. For you, O oh Lord, have not forsaken those who seek you. I love that. Yeah. You seek oh, okay. God, He's not going to forsake you. Yeah. You put your trust in Him. He'll not disappoint you. And it's great. Yeah, tell him to come in. I, I really appreciate what I read there. Yeah. I thank God for it. The Lord is blessed. And He keeps blessing. I have so many opportunities throughout the week to tell how good the Lord has been to me. And when I believe the Lord has given me so many blessings and, and opportunities to share it, then I know I'm in the right place where God wants me. And I praise His name. Amen. I witnessed to people from different parts of the country this past week. Some on the phone, some in person. And it has been a pleasure to tell them how much the Lord has blessed me. And I pray that they become blessed also by that. It's your turn. Don has a microphone. Well, I guess you better go.
scripture reading today is taken from Romans, the seventh chapter. Romans, the seventh chapter, and we will begin with verse one. When you have found it, say amen. Romans 7. I hear one amen. amen. There's another. Amen. Romans 7, beginning with verse 1. I am reading from the New American Standard Bible. Or do you not know, brethren, for I am speaking of those who know the law, that the law has jurisdiction over a person as long as he lives. For the married woman is bound by law to her husband while he is living. But if her husband dies, she is released from the law concerning the husband. So then if while her husband is living, she is joined to another, another man, she shall be called an adulteress. But if her husband dies, she is free from the law, so that she is not an adulteress, though she is joined to another man. Therefore, my brethren, you also were made to die to the law through the body of Christ, so that you might be joined to another, to him who was raised from the dead, in order that we might bear fruit for God. Those of you that have unspoken requests that you want to send to God right now, raise your hand. There are many hands. I want you to be telling God what they are. God can hear you. And God knows what they are. But He wants us to tell Him. Shall we, for those that are able, kneel as we pray? Our righteous Father, we're so thankful that we can come to you today on your holy day in your church as we meet together to praise your name. Father, we're so thankful that you have made it possible for us to worship you unmolested. And Lord, we pray that we'll continue in those freedoms. Father, we thank you for Jesus. We thank you that you gave him, gave him to us, that he may die, and he died for us, that we may have eternal life, that he paid the penalty of our sins. Oh, Father, we pray that your Holy Spirit will now come into our lives and, and, and change us so that we will not continue in those sins. For we ask for forgiveness of those sins. And we ask for a life-changing experience day by day, moment by moment, as we yield to your will. Lord, we pray and each hand that went up, along with that hand that went up to heaven to see, pointing to you that they have requests. They, uh, they, each person has needs. Some are personal. Some are concerning loved ones that do not know you. Other needs. There's so much sickness in this world and in this church. We ask that you will especially be with each one. There are those of our number that are not here. I do not know all, but we do know that there are some that are whole because they're sick. And we pray that you will bless them with your healing hand, that they'll get well again. Bring them back to us. Father, we pray that you will bless our speaker today. Anoint his lips with coals on the altar. Lord, we pray that the words he speaks, 
you'll be speaking through me. That a message will be your message. And that our hearts may be open to your will and your way. Is our prayer in Christ's name. First, understand the problem we're dealing true. with. Uh, I would like to Probably point your attention. I'm not preaching the book of Revelation, but in every, but in every church of the seven churches, there is a phrase that is repeated. You have a mic. Yeah, but I think Don needs to turn up the volume. Yeah, give me a little volume up there. He's using a portable mic. Seven times in the book of Revelation, chapter 23, where it speaks about the seven churches. Uh, let me pick it up from my text. Turn with me, Revelation chapter 3. There are four churches in chapter 2. And three in chapter three. Every time the messages to the church is ends, it ends with a phrase that says, "He who overcomes, or he who has victory or victorious, shall in no way be injured by the second death." Revelation chapter two, verse eleven, for example. And as you go on. In all the seven churches, let me read the one, the last church of the Laodicean church. It goes like this. He says, He who overcomes, I will grant him to sit beside me on my throne. Amen. As I myself overcame and sat down beside my father on his throne. Now, this overcome thing caught my attention. Amen. And I asked the question. Overcome of what? It is true that for every church there is a circumstance in which the church is found. For example, Thyatira had a woman called Jezebel, mm -hmm. a false prophet, he says. Well, I imagine when he said overcome, you have to overcome teaching of Jezebel, the situation. There is an exterior. A situation in which each church is facing and therefore whoever overcomes. But I'm not happy with that. Because there is more to that little phrase. He who overcomes. Because when you come to the last church, to the Laodicean church, there is nothing outside to overcome. The faithful witness describe the condition of the church and then he says he who overcomes Amen. overcome from what? have you ever pondered on that question? because it is repeated to each church should caught your attention
To overcome the lukewarmness. Because Laodicea was lukewarm, weren't they? Okay. But lukewarm is a symptom. When somebody is sick, you have the symptom and then you have the cause. I have a fever, but because I have an infection somewhere. Being lukewarm, there is something that is causing that lukewarmness. There is an interior more intrinsic problem that has caused the love is here to be like that. Now, now I have more power. Thank you. As I study this overcoming thing with the the message of righteousness by faith in the book of Romans, I think I know you have had enough. Enough now. You have had plenty of Romans recently. <laughs> but I want to go over uh, themes of Romans because we are studying the topic of righteousness by faith. Uh, I'll give you a link and a connection with Revelation in the book of Romans. Let me see if I can go with this. Yes, sir. Well, let me see if we can. I got a small link in the book of Revelation when the faithful witness examined the church and he told the Laodicean church four things. When he says you are rich, you have, we, have a, we don't need anything. We are, in, we, are, we are okay. And he said, you don't know. You said you know, but he said, you don't know that you are miserable. And uh, pitiless, naked, poor, naked, I said. I picked that first word, miserable, and find out yes, that it is an intrinsic interior condition. What is this? Oh, wretched man, Romans 24. He said, You don't know that you are wretched, only two places in the Bible. I found that big word. In Revelation chapter 3, he said, you are wretched. What does it mean to be wretched? It's a characteristic in the condition of the Laodicean church. It has to do with the message of righteousness by faith. When Paul in Romans 27 made the plea, the cry, he said, oh wretched man that I am, who will deliver me? from the body of this day. Now, in Romans 7, there is a whole development of the problem of sin in relation to the law and grace, etc. This is what we are going to study this morning. Before we move to Romans 7, let me give you a synthesis, quickly the big picture of the book of Romans, so that you can copy the message of Romans 7 and understand the cry of Paul about the human, intrinsic, interior, desperate human condition in which Christians are. And this is where you and I have to have victory. Because he has to overcome his wretchedness. He has to overcome his poverty. He has to overcome his pitifulness. He has to overcome the diagnosis that the faithful witness discovered in the church. And I pick Laodicea because it is closer to us and we are proud to be Laodicea. We tell people that we are in the Laodicean dispensation. We are uh, 
of that term. Okay? The book of Romans is divided into three sections. Chapter 1 to chapter 8 is the theory or the theology of salvation. Chapter 9, 10, and 11, he answer a question that remains in the air about, the, about God's promise and the Jewish nation. We call it the Jewish question. The whole three chapter will treat the problem of the Jews, how they will be saved. I'm coming to that in the next circle. I'll make you laugh and I'll make you cry. In that section about the Jewish people. Today, there are radio stations lobbying for the Jewish nation, etc. Then we come to chapter 12 to 16, which is the practical or the subjective experience one has how do we live the gospel? This is why in Paul's teaching, there is a complete difference between the gospel and the fruit of the gospel. We have for many years confused people in our teaching. And we have thought that obedience is the gospel. What God is doing in me is the gospel. My victory in my life is the gospel. It will not save anybody. It is the result of the Holy Spirit in my life. It is the fruit of righteousness. Don't mix up the gospel and the fruit of the gospel. And Paul in his majesty and his great book makes the complete division between the two. This is why he put the Jewish question to separate the two. Therefore, when you preach in that section of the book of Romans, if I preach in Romans chapter 12, you will know that I'm going to teach about the subjective experience of salvation. Many preachers today are still preaching and breaking the pulpit, sounding the subjective experience that we need to live as the gospel. You click on YouTube, you see people telling their stories, so I'm going to preach the gospel, and he tells the stories how God, or what God is doing in their lives. Beautiful as it may be. Mark this. It is not the gospel. I can stand you, tell you stories what happened with me. Maybe it will encourage you a little bit. The gospel is what happened in Jesus. In Jesus, God saved, redeemed, and restored humanity as an objective fact in one man. Only in Jesus, the character of God was really revealed. Only in Jesus, that redemption happened. Because he, in Romans 5, as the second Adam, the obedience of one Amen. affected all. Yes. The sin of one brought all of them in condemnation. How one person affects all. Now, when Paul was converted, when he met Jesus, I said this morning, let me bring this up. It's very interesting. In Galatians, he said, after he met Christ in Damascus Road, what happened to Paul? He disappeared. Thanks to Galatians, he, he left a piece of information. He said, I, I went for Arabia. Mm -hmm. He's going to Arabia. What for? He wanted to turn off. I believe he went to the foot of Sinai. Because today we know that Sinai is in Saudi Arabia. He said it in the Bible. We have been looking for Sinai, don't they? In the Sinai Peninsula. All the maps in the Bible will tell you where is Sinai. In the Sinai Peninsula. When Israel left Egypt, let me have this. The Sinai Peninsula was Egyptian territory. This is why Moses didn't want to stay in the Sinai Peninsula, we call it. 
He went all the way to the kingdom of God. But they were following God led them all the way. Yes, God was leading them. Therefore, he said, I went to Arabia, and I, I think he climbed a mountain where God revealed his love to the children of Moses and to the children of Israel. Because he had received the revelation of Jesus Christ. He took time out to rethink. Everything changed now. Yeah. If Jesus is the promised Messiah, everything changed. So he left his religion. He left Judaism. To rethink. The gospel God called him to preach to the Gentiles. No. This is why the apostle called him at one time. He said, We would like to hear what you are preaching. Apparently, you're making a straight sound. He said, The gospel I'm preaching, I didn't go to Jerusalem. I never met the apostle. I received by a revelation. Jesus himself revealed and taught him where? In those three years. He spent in the Sinai in the Arabian desert. No. Most probably he went in the cave where Elijah was. No. And look at the walls of the cave. Many have gone through there. So he went back on the steps of these great men of God, Moses, Elijah. And we're thinking, and he came back with one doctrine. We can call it the in Christ motive. He explains all the intention of God in Christ. And in that doctrine, in the book of Romans, he developed four titles of doctrine. Number one, after he introduced in chapter one, the righteousness of God. Then in chapter 23, he takes 60 verses to explain the universality of sin. Be careful. In our doctrines, we deal and we explain the sinfulness of man. In Romans, he deals with the universality of sin. How sin has spread like bushfire. Yes. And it doesn't matter the color, race, time, and where you live. Mm -hmm. Sin has affected you and the whole human race. Yes, sir. The disobedience of one man. So he developed this. He, he presented the problem first. For you to develop a clear theology of righteousness by faith, you need to have a clear development or understanding of sin. Mm -hmm. If you don't understand sin, if you wrongly define sin, you will wrongly define righteousness. This is what happened with us. Because we have defined sin as an act, a legal act that we have committed. When I was a Roman Catholic church, I was a Roman Catholic, sorry. Mm -hmm. uh, I was still young. I was thought that we need to go and confess to the priest. I did many times. Confession. But you can go and confess. It doesn't matter. You can go and sin again and tomorrow go and confess. Mm. Mercy. It's mercy. Mercy. And therefore, I, I play this game. Back and forth. And this is the gospel I have. <laughs> mercy. Until I understand that sin is not only legal. I say not only legal. It's a moral issue. It's a principle. It is something in us. Yeah, both of them. My condition is sinful, therefore I, pro I produce what? Sinfulness, and I produce acts of sin. I was, I was dealing with the acts of sin. When I found the gospel, it talks about the principle of sin. The law of sin. Therefore, what we have here, he develops his theology of sin. In chapter 4, he deals with works and faith, and he pulled out an example. Of circumcision. He used the example of Abraham, chapter 4. And said that we are saved by faith. Yeah. Saved by grace, through faith. Abraham believed, 
when he was still in circumcised, so that he can be the father of the uncircumcised and the circumcised. In chapter 5, he deals with what? Our condition, our condemned condition versus righteousness. He brings in an example in the text. Adam. We have two Adams. The first one gave us what? Condemnation. Yeah. We are born condemned on death row. Yeah. We need to be born in order to have what? Righteousness. So, as you follow Paul, there is a contrast, a thesis and antithesis. He developed his teaching of the gospel with this contrast of one condition into another. So in Romans 5, it's about grace. How does he explain grace? God saved humanity in one man, Christ Jesus, who gave us uh, justification. Yes. This is grace. Man. Now, when you read chapter 6, chapter 6 is a problem. Let us go down to chapter 6. Uh, it is with death and life. But in chapter 6, there are a lot of contrasts. I think I have it here. Uh, let me see if I... And the law and the grace, verse 14. Servant of sin, servant of righteousness. It is about the old man and the new man. It is about death, he speaks about life. He speaks about the body of sin, he speaks about right instrument of righteousness. He, he speaks about uh, dominions of sin, he speaks about obedience to righteousness. He speaks about burial, and then he speaks about resurrection. There is in chapter 6 a series of contrasts. Complaints to show these. Uh, let's jump to chapter 8 and then we go back to chapter 9. In chapter 8, it speaks about what? Flesh and spirit. Because when you read chapter 8, we are starting to deal with what? He's closing his theory and starts to speak about sanctification to end up in glorification at the end of chapter 8. Therefore, you see in the development the three phases of salvation. Uh, right as by faith. Uh, you see justification, uh, sanctification, and then it ends up with glorification. Uh, Hispanic people, be careful in your translation. In English, we have two terms. Righteousness by faith and justification by faith. In English, it means two things. Righteousness by faith includes what? The three phases of salvation. Righteousness by faith is a term that includes justification by faith. It, it includes sanctification by faith. And it includes glorification in Christ Jesus to faith. Justification by faith is one act. In the Spanish Bible, they have not made the distinction. They have translated la justificación por la fe for both terms. Remember, therefore, it means two things. Righteousness by faith. When I say righteousness by faith in English, I'm all inclusive. When I say justification by faith, I mean one act. Are you with me? Okay. I saw this in the Spanish Bible. I said they had a difficulty to, to make that distinction in translation. In chapter 8, therefore, he speaks about what? The life of the flesh and life of the spirit. Because in chapter 7, he has introduced another problem. We call it the law of the spirit that will subject the law of sin in us. This is where I want to keep and pick up the topic of victory. Why are we not experiencing victory? Of a sin. We are dealing with the act of sin, we are not dealing with the principles and the law of sin. Now, God knew that. In Romans chapter 7, now I start to preach, there are three problems. The first problem is in chapter, uh, sorry, is in verse 4. 
In verse 2, he introduces an example. Remember, in every chapter, he brings an example. Abraham, he speaks about baptism in chapter 6. He speaks about Adam in chapter, chapter 5. He speaks about baptism in chapter 6. And in chapter 7, he brings the example of marriage. Remember, he's using marriage as an example. He's not talking about divorce and people getting remarried or whatsoever. He uses that example to, as an, uh, he used marriage as an example to explain how we are free from the law. In chapter 6, he said we are free from sin. In chapter 7, we are free from the law. Now, follow this. What does he say to us for? In a good translation, therefore, brethren, or likewise, brethren, you have been put to death in the body of Christ on the cross of Calvary. So that somebody, the old man, dies. Now, in the in the example, he says a woman is married and is bound by the law of marriage to that first husband. She can only marry a second husband if the first husband dies. Now follow his argument. Who is the first husband in the application? Uh, he gives the example and then he comes to the application. What is he referring to as the first husband? Help me. Who is the first husband we are married to? Now, just look at the parallels. All these chapters, they are parallels. They will tell you easily. It represents the first Adam, our human old man. When we are born, we are born as married to who? The old man. The old man. Mm -hmm. The old, human, sinful, Adamic man that we are, that we have. Now, in all, there is a second husband waiting for us that was created in Christ. Now you will understand grace. How God reworked salvation. And the destiny of humanity in one man was Jesus. He created in his body a second humanity. Knowing that the, this old man that we have inside cannot be polished or modified or whatever. He needs to die. And when Christ died, and rose in the morning, it was not a remodeling of the old man. The old man is dead. <coughs> the old man is dead. Yeah. When Christ rose again, it is not a resurrection of the old man. Everything is new. Man. In the resurrection. This is why I say sometimes people don't understand me. I say the Christ who resurrected is not the same Christ who died. It is in that sense. He crucified and put to death the first husband. Because Christ took upon himself what? Yes. He became sin. He became sin. He assumed something that was not his. Yeah. He assumed it on himself. Man. This is why he said, I also have victory. You will have victory just like I have. Christ had victory over the issue when he picked up the sinful human nature and went on the cross. This was the whole struggle in the garden. He didn't train his but when he walked in that garden, when he decided to go to Calvary, it was a struggle. It was a battle. A victory to win. Now, 
Likewise, brethren, you have been put to death in verse 4. Now, remember this truth. When somebody is converted, the first husband is dead. Yes. This is what the chapter says. When you were baptized, you were baptized in Christ. And when you came out, you came out as a new person. The same thing is repeated in verse chapter 7. Now, the first, the first difficulty is to identify the first husband and the second husband. The first husband, therefore, and the law. And remember, in chapter 7, he deals with under the grace. He deals with the law, in fact. How man is released from that condition under law yeah. to be put under grace. Christ did not obey instead of us. He obeyed for us in him. Mm. Now, now pick this up mm. carefully in English. My Pentecostal friends, when I give them Bible study, say, no, Christ died. Christ obeyed the law for me so I don't have to obey. Mercy. I said, be careful. No. He obeyed for you, it's but not instead father. of you. For the Father. Because if he obeyed instead of you, died instead of you, he went to heaven also instead of you. You will never get there. <laughs> <laughs> he died for you because you were in him. Because of the sinfulness of the flesh, you could not accomplish or fulfill the righteous demands of the law. Man. Therefore, in Jesus, he obeyed for me. When he was obeying, I was, don't wait, I was in him. And his obedience, what happened in Christ, I was obeying God in Christ Jesus. When he came here, this was good news when he arrived. Because he picked up humanity and put in one man and rewrote the story and the sin of humanity. Your story. Mm -hmm. But all this is an objective fact. This is what God did in Christ Jesus. This is why it's good news. Yes. God did in him. And he put us in him. And he obeyed for me. Now, when it comes subjectively to me, Christ comes in me. This is another story. I have to obey. Therefore, free from the law doesn't mean you are free from obedience to the law. It's a false teaching. Now, the whole Pentecostal, the whole Protestant churches has fallen into a trap mm -hmm. about the law. Teaching that because we are not in the law, we are not subject to obedience to the law. Therefore, we don't have to give us, we don't have to give us a sign. You are a Sabbatistas. They tell me. Uh, I said, yes, you know, I'm proud of it. Because Jesus was a Sabbatista. He said, the apostle was a Sabbatista. He said, yeah, true. And therefore, I'm on the right track. I'm just following them. <laughs> I was about this dust. Just to tease and tease the bullet and to mock. The advantage. You are Sabbatist. You keep the Sabbath. Therefore, free from the law in Romans 7 is a big problem and big difficulty. God has not freed us from obedience to the law, but the condemnation of the law. Yes, man. Because our condition. Yes. Therefore, he changed our status from under law to under grace, from condemnation to justification. He has already Amen. dealt with this. Amen. From the flesh to the spirit. Yes, sir. The first husband is the fleshly, sinful, dreadful nature that Adam. Has given us. This is why sin is universal. I was born in a very good family, but I discovered what? Yes. Now, when Adam sinned, I was not there. 
but he represented me. Everybody was in him when he died. Well, I'm sorry, when he transgressed the law. Yeah. This is why for, for human solidarity, we agree with him. In fact, when we are born, he as a sinful man, we are in agreement with Adam and what he did. This is why those who not go through the uh, rebirth process, what will happen? The consequences of the wrath of God. The second difficulty in the chapter 7, Paul makes a declaration further down in the text. He says, when, I think it's verse 12. He says, when one time I live, read the text. I think it's 11. Romans 7. Okay. Verse 6. But now we are discharged from the law. To live in the newness of life in obedience to God. It's the end of verses. What then do we conclude? Is the law identical to sin? Certainly not. Nevertheless, if it had not been for the law, I should not have recognized sin or have known it meaning for I would not have known about covetousness if the law had not said you shall not covet and have an evil desire for themselves. But sin, finding, I mean verse 8, finding opportunity in the commandments, the commandments, we just mentioned the tenth, the last commandment of covetousness he mentioned above. Uh, got a hold on me and arise and stimulate all kinds of forbidden desire for without law sin is dead I once was alive but quit apart from uh, and consciousness of the law but when the commandment came sin lived again and I died now and the very, verse 10, and the very legal ordinance which was designed and intended to bring life actually proved to bring death. For sin seizing the opportunity and the hold of me uh, from the commandments begin and entrap me using it as a weapon to kill me. As if the law, we were supposed to do something good has caused his death. He said, but be careful, it's not the law who killed me. Because the law is not uh, something bad. It is sin that killed me. Now you will understand something, how, to how deep he goes in this topic. The old man, the first husband, was born under the tendency and sinfulness of man. He says, God has put all humanity in the law. And in that condition, he said, sin killed me. <coughs> in the process of the killing of the first husband, sin is the, uh, the venom. Now in the text you have the venom and the antidote. He said, uh, sin is the venom that killed me in the process. But the commandment came. When I became conscious of the condition, it was not the law who killed me. It was sin. Because sin in itself is a killer. It's a total destroyer. Yeah. So in the process of dying of this old man, the first husband, it was, he said, it was sin, it was the pain who, who killed me. Using what? Using the commandment. Okay. Can, you, can you follow his reasoning? Can you go deep with what he's trying to say here? Mm -hmm. Now, then he comes in with another problem. The third difficulty, he said, uh, once I live 
without the law. Now, be careful with Paul because there are at least two I in the text. Sometimes he says I, referring to the old man, and sometimes he says I, talking to the new man. You need to know what he's talking about. <laughs> and therefore, I once lived. The old man lived uh, once upon a time without God. When he was living then, he said, sin was dead. Sin was dead. And I was alive. Yes. Means the first husband. He said, when the commandment came, sin killed me, I died, and he comes upon, and sin came alive in me, in the body of this death. Now you will understand what is happening here, folks. In the life of every born again Christian, sin is not dead. He is dead for those who are still in the law. Those who have come to Christ. The old first husband is dead, and sin in his principle has come alive. I experienced it in my own life. And all of you have experience in your very life. The struggle against the law of sin. And now I come to where the door turns. To the hub of the issue about victory that the book of Revelation is talking about. He's talking about the law of sin that has come alive in the life of the believer. Now, God knew that, that all born again Christians will have to face a reality. And He made a provision. We call it the law of the Spirit that will subject, dominate the law of sin at work in the body. This is at the end of chapter 7 now, as we come back. He made this cry. He said, I want to do good, but good is not in me. I discover in me a problem. Now, be careful. Some theologians commented, they said, no, Paul is talking about when he was not converted. Read the text carefully. There are interior indices in the text that tells you he's talking to a new born again Christian. He said, in my mind, in me, I delighted in them to do God's will. I want to do good. But I discover in me another law fighting the law of my mind. And the struggle uh, is so intense in me that finally he said, he had to cry out. He's looking for solution. He's looking for victory. He finds it nowhere. Who will deliver me? He said, not from sin. Who will deliver me from the body of this death in which the law of sin has come alive and is working? Make no mistake. You will not live your Christian life Far away from this reality. But the good news is that God made a provision. He knew that when you come to the second marriage, when you marry Christ, sin comes alive in you. Just as he triumphed, just as he had victory. He said, you will have victory too. Yeah. Because he made a provision. We call it the law of the spirit. How does the law of the spirit operate in us? It is the development of Romans chapter 8. Now you will understand the flesh and the spirit in that chapter. That's sanctification now. Now let me close. Let me go back to the 
This is how the contract chapter 6. He that overcome it, the same shall be clothed in white, ga white garments. And I will not blot out his name out of the book of life, but I will confess his name before my Father and before his angels. What a promise. Those who have victory will be clothed in white raiment. And I will confess his name before my father and before his angels. I think this one is to the church of chapter 5. Uh, Sardis. To the Philadelphia church. Him that overcometh. And he's talking to Protestant America. We in Philadelphia church. He that overcometh. Will I make a pillar in the temple of my God? And he shall go no more out. And I will write upon him the name of my God. And the name of the city of my God. Which is New Jerusalem. Which cometh now from heaven from my God. And I will write upon him. My new name. What a promise to those who triumph. It's a real thing in salvation. And that comes to the audition. The last church I repeat. To him that overcometh, and we are dealing with those who are struggling with uh, those wretches, those whose sin has come alive in his life. He said, those who overcome through the Lord of the Spirit, through the power of the Spirit, and subject the Lord of sin in the life. He said, he that overcome, will I grant to sit with me in my throne, even as I also overcame and sat down with my father on his throne. Jesus is coming again. And he is coming, let me quote this from the desire of angel. He is coming to deal with the transgressor of his law and the contender of his grace. He is coming again. Yeah. Now, the promise of victory is a promise for all. We can overcome. We can experience in our lives a complete submission of the law of sin alive in us through the power of the Holy Spirit that can operate in us through the power of the Holy Spirit. This is the experience we Christian, we needs to know, needs to experience the victory and overcome in our lives. Sin should not be a constant struggle. We should subject it and subject it once and for all and take control of your Christian life. May God bless us as we seek and continue to ponder these great topics. Amen. Of salvation by faith. The problem of the Laodicean church is this. He was stand on the door of God. It's the gospel invitation. He wants to come in. He uh, read the message again. The problem of the Laodicean church is righteousness by faith. It's the gospel. And he keeps on knocking. He says, He who hear my voice, He who hear my voice. Not everybody. Everybody will hear, but not everybody will hear. Exactly. But he who hear his voice, he will come in. Yes. Who is he who gives you victory? Is the one who comes in mm -hmm. and makes your life a feast. Man. I will sup with him. And your life will be a supper with Christ Jesus. This is the true Christian living. Yes. A supper with Christ. You have a series of, you have the 27 gold in here. Yeah, the, no. No, you don't have all. But we have the one we're dealing with. Sometimes we have a relapse to the old sinful. I'm reading down here. I think it's number on the right column, the third paragraph. Sometimes we have a relapse to the old sinful way. I don't know who composed this. 
But look how beautiful it is. He said, maybe a harsh word to someone or some other sin that we are needing to overcome. We are thankful for the promise in 1 John 1 9 that he will forgive us. You will sin. But you have the promise he will forgive us. When we sleep and fall, it is because we are trying to overcome by what? Trying to overcome by ourselves. We are fighting with the fight of sin. We are fighting with sin. You cannot fight. You don't have the power. Let the law of the Spirit work in you and overcome in subject the law of sin. It's subjective. And to close, we need the daily, we need to die daily to serve and let the Holy Spirit take over and control our lives and leave you with this thought. It is possible to overcome. Let the Holy Spirit work within you and establish the principle of the law of the Spirit in your life. Where we pray. Restful and loving Father, we are thankful that this morning we can point on these great themes of the gospel. We come to realize that there is more to that. That sin not only is in the universe and has come so deep in our lives and has come alive in us as we come to Christ, but praise be to God that you have made provision. Yes. That victory is possible. That we can overcome just like Jesus did. Today, we pray that you will establish in us the power of the Holy Spirit in each and every one of us. Bless us here this morning as we try to understand your works in us. Yeah. And help us submit ourselves on a daily basis as we die daily to I and die daily to self. Bless us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Amen.